Hi everyone, I'm Sophie Gripenberg and I'm a sustainability professional. Uh, I do research about sustainability and I also help company, companies and organizations to improve their sustainability work. Uh, I'm a big, um, very passionate about making this world a better place. And this video is um, specifically for the topic of climate change. And I'm not going to talk so much about the socioeconomic effects of climate change. I'm going to talk more about some of the recent facts. And the reason why I'm doing this presentation and the reason why I'm presenting this to you is that it's not my presentation. It's not uh, my wish to do this. Well, of course I want to do this, but this is actually um, a person that has passed away a few weeks ago and he dedicated his whole life to make this world a better place in so many different ways uh, as a humanitarian within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement but also with environmental organizations in Sweden and as a politician in the, his um, the municipality where he lived and he was very very concerned about the um, the ongoing climate crisis and the, the way the atmosphere is changing and the way the temperature is increasing. So he actually did this presentation and it was one of his um, last wish uh, to, uh, to spread this, these words. Um, and I know he truly cared about these topics and I was uh, very, very fond of him and I really admired him. And so I'm going to do this presentation to honor him and honor his message and um, yeah I'm getting emotional um, so so it's not my presentation and a lot of the facts he's been um, collected are from from uh, IPCC the 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 independent governmental organization at the UN level about the climate crisis uh, some of them are also from the newspaper Dagens Nyheter in Sweden where they do um, do a lot of reporting about climate crisis uh, and some of these facts and information might not necessarily be updated and when it comes to climate science uh, it's uh, the scenarios and and um, about the future are changing quite a lot um, and it can change quite quickly because we get more and more information about the climate crisis so some things i'm saying here might not be exactly the figures or numbers in a few months to come and that doesn't mean this research isn't reliable. It just means that what we've seen so far, that the, the things are changing way quicker than we thought just a few decades ago. Um, so I just want to say that, that these are not like it should be seen as, as um, absolute facts. They can vary it a little bit. And I highly encourage you to, um, to stay updated on these, um, these topics. And the presentation, um, just studied the presentation in, in Swedish, but I'm, I'm doing this in English now because I do have a lot of international friends and a lot of people in my network doesn't understand or speak Swedish. So I'm going to talk in English, but uh, the presentation will be in Swedish and I will try to do my best to explain it to you. Um, so, uh, yeah. This is Jösta Eriksson, and he was, I got to know him because he was a volunteer with the, with the Swedish Red Cross, and he was uh, one of the sustainability ambassadors volunteers. So he, I had the honor to guide him as a volunteer leader, and uh, what he did that he was trying to educate, assist and support the, the local Swedish Red Cross branch in his region about sustainable development and specifically about climate and environment. And this is his presentation, and um, and I'm doing this to to honor him, and I'm doing this because I we both know how important this uh, topic is. So we're going to start this presentation by talking about carbon dioxide that's being released into the atmosphere, and due to the use of fossil fuels uh, that has been stayed in the ground for millions and millions of years, that humanity now the last day. Yeah, last hundred years have started to to use, um, which is resulting in more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Um, and when scientists are measuring how how much uh, green grass um, uh, green grass there are in the atmosphere, 
they are using something called parts per million ppm and carbon dioxide is currently 414.19 parts per million and that can be very difficult to know how much is this is this a lot is this a little um, and normally we we do a comparison to the night the end of 19th century before industrialization to to have some kind of understanding of how much more carbon dioxide are humanity releasing into the atmosphere and we can see that since then each and every year in this graphic it shows from the 1960s the the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are increasing and it's increasing every year. Uh, I mean, now due to the pandemic, there have been um, the, the release of carbon emissions has decreased, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the same as how much parts per million of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere. And, and that figure is actually the one that truly counts in the end. And the reason why, also why we're seeing this increase in parts per million is that carbon dioxide also have a very long life span. Uh, it's about 100 years. So what's in the atmosphere now was released many, many decades ago. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that not easily disappear or transforms. It stays quite for a long time in the atmosphere. So even if we do take action now and we see that we're releasing less greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide it's going to take some time for us to see the true effects of this it's quite quite a long time and what Jesta has done here he's been summarizing some of the ipc's uh, scenarios uh, for how much more ppm uh, carbon dioxide we might have in the atmosphere in the future and these scenarios are based on uh, what kind of actions we're taking on a political level. Um, so I'm going to guide you through throughout these three scenarios. And like I said, the, these, these three scenarios might change when we have more facts and we'll see how we currently are doing. Um, so 2.6 stands for 2.6 degrees um, and that's the average temperature globally. So that means that we're going to look at that as well, but that means different temperatures in different areas because that's just an average. And that is the closest we get to the Paris Agreement. According to the Paris Agreement that was written by the political leaders uh, in 2015, we're supposed to keep the global warming under two degrees uh, with striving or like um, aiming for 1.5. And it's actually a huge difference between 1.5 and 2, even though we might not think so. And um, that has to do that the effects on 2 degrees are way more uh, serious than the effects on 1.5 degrees. And for example, there are countries um, the, in the Pacific Ocean that at 1.5 degrees, they might be able to stay above sea, level, um, sea levels. But at two degrees, that they are mostly unlikely not be able to stay above sea level. So for some countries and some people, this that minor change as we see it in temperature actually has a huge um, uh, effect on a on a global level, and, and for some of these vulnerable communities and societies. And um, to get to to reach the Paris Agreement or stay in line with the Paris Agreement, we need a very, very strong, um, very, very strong political actions. And I, I'm not sure exactly how it is today, but a few months ago when I read about how the countries are doing, considering being in line with the Paris Agreement, it was quite evident that uh, most of them are not. Uh, actually, I think it was just two countries that has uh, a political ambition that was in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, and, uh, and in this scenario, we also need to reduce the methane, methane, I hope I pronounce it correct now in English. And that is another greenhouse gas that has a shorter lifespan, but it's way stronger, if that makes sense. So with more methane in the atmosphere, the temperature is increasing more strongly. 
Uh, so the good part is that when we reduce methane, we can actually in a few decades see a quick change, but it's a very, very strong greenhouse gas and it's very, very dangerous. Um, and what's just is more pointing out here that we definitely need to reduce our use of oil. We need to uh, keep the population on the world um, at a certain level. And we definitely need to transform the way we use farmlands. Today, all the world's farmlands, uh, like usable and good farmland is already used today. And uh, we still have people who aren't fed. We still throw away uh, one third of all the food that's being produced. We still use a lot of our um, agriculture lands to, to, um, to grow animal fodder and crops. And that we need to completely transform the food system if we're able to meet this uh, 1 point, 2.6 degrees. Um, and then we have the next scenario, which is, which is 4.5. We are missing the Paris Agreement. We still need strong political actions. We, may, we, can't, we can only increase our emissions until 2040. Uh, that's the time span. So, it's less than 20 years. Uh, we definitely still need to use less energy. We definitely need to plant more forests. Uh, we need to use less agriculture land and uh, we definitely need to change our consumption behavior. So, and the worst case is uh, not a fun case at all. Um, and that means that we keep on releasing the emissions that we're, that we're doing today. And they will be three times as high in, in um, 80 years compared to now. And the, the, the population of the, the planet is still increasing, which is, means that more and more people are consuming, more and more people are, are claiming a land and um, we need to produce more food. Um, and we're still very dependent on fossil fuels. And our Unfortunately, the, that scenario, the latest scenario, the last scenario, is um, it looks like that's where we're heading. Uh, we, we, um, we don't have those political enforcement at the moment pointing at that we definitely not going to go to a worst case scenario. And here we can also say that the world global leaders are, have agreed to keep on, on the two degrees. Um, and there's, there's no trend as we're seeing it today where this might change. And um, since I live in Sweden and we might be fortunate in Sweden in the sense that we're living in a welfare society in state that might have, um, we have better opportunities to deal with a changing climate compared to less developed countries that doesn't have um, the same standards, the same financial resources to work in adaptive and um, adapted way. However, uh, the temperature are increasing differently uh, on, the, on the globe and the countries who are closer to the um, Arctic, um, Arctic, um, the Arctic is of course warming way more quicker than, than the rest of the world. Uh, so in Sweden, the, the world has today increased its temperature with 1.2 degrees. And in Sweden, it's already 2.1 degrees. And some people might say, well, that doesn't that just means that we have longer summers, shorter winters, some people would like it. But we don't know today how these um, global ecological systems, how they're changing. Because when spring comes earlier, there's also a change in the ecological systems. Um, it's also changing water systems. Uh, it, drier su summer mice, for example, lead to less groundwater. And, and how all those things play out and, and exactly in what way we are being affected, we don't really know. But we see that we will have more in Europe. We already have uh, big problems with very, very warm summers. And that people are dying due to the heat. And we also see there's, a, there's um, more and more water shortage because when more and more glaciers are melting and more groundwater is used for unsustainable food production, we see that suddenly it's not as easy anymore to get fresh water. 
Um, so the, these, um, the change in the climate has multiply effects on other systems and how that interact with humans depends of course on the socioeconomic system, but that we all going to be affected is 100% sure. Um, and it's not for, for the good. So, and this is also a graph showing the, the change I talked about earlier in the presentation of the pre-industrial temperature compared to today. And this is how it looks like in Sweden. And of course, um, sometimes you see climate skeptical people are talking about that and they comparing the temperature today with the temperature last year or the three years before and say like, you, you see the temperature is getting colder here instead of warmer, climate change is a hoax and blah, blah, blah. But uh, there's a difference between predicting the weather and looking at the weather and looking at um, climate change science. It, they have different methods and they, they, you collect data in different ways. And it's, um, I think it's, it's, it could be difficult to understand um, climate change research, but I think if more people understood what it is and how they're doing it, it's, yeah, it, you have to compare uh, the weather, the temperature and uh, parts per million over, over many years and many decades to see a little bit how we can actually see that this is something that's not really normal, depending on the season. Um, but yeah, so in Sweden, the temperature has increased by two degrees Celsius. And again, we're having these three scenarios that I was going through in a little bit in the beginning, that unfortunately we're not heading in a good direction. Um, it could be very hard to understand what these scenarios might mean. And as I said, there's multiply effects. I'm going into a little bit about that, but that means that we don't we, we don't really know. Um, for example, that um, the, a lot of the carbon dioxide that has been released into the atmosphere so far has been buffered by the ocean. And what that means is that the ocean is basically, um, how would you say it in English, but it's um, sucking in the, the carbon dioxide, it stores the carbon dioxide. So it's not in the atmosphere, it ends up in the ocean. And that means that the ocean gets warmer and it means that we, for example, see more coral bleaching and, and so on, which affects, of course, the fishing system, the fishes and the marine systems. And these kind of scale effects, we, we, it's very, very hard to say exactly what this means for humans. But what we can see is that that's not a good thing. Um, and there are signs that systems, forest, oceans that have been able to store carbon might flip over to a new, new state, uh, which means that those previous feedback mechanisms that system used to have are changed into another feedback mechanism. Uh, which means that they might release more carbon dioxide. Uh, and then, then we definitely have a big, big problem because that's not only then human, what humans do, nature itself are suddenly saying no and, and suddenly starting to release carbon dioxide and we need to take more, even more action. Um, so this is a um, very, very hot planet in the, in the worst case scenario. Uh, still in the second scenario, we still have this very high temperature changing. You can see it close to the Arctic in the north. There, there's, we're still talking about four or five degrees temperature increase. Um, and the best case scenario, it's, it's still a serious, it's still a serious um, scenario. Uh, we still, we are currently living in the climate crisis. This is not something that will happen in the future. It's something that's already happening. One degree is already serious. Um, we haven't had this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for millions and millions of years. Um, and we don't really know what will happen to the planet and Earth systems in this uh, kind of very, very warm global world. Well, I think it might be difficult for you guys to see this one. And for people who understand Swedish, you can go to WWF in Sweden's website and you can download this PDF for yourself. But I think they've done a quite good job trying to uh, explain a little bit better what this global warming actually means. 
so they'd be taking a few examples, for example, they have said that uh, if you have a two degrees warming, cities like Amsterdam will be under sea level. And of course, Amsterdam, Netherlands uh, can keep on building walls against the ocean. They have been fighting the ocean for quite some time. Um, but it means that uh, on, with two degrees, if nature has its way, Amsterdam is going to be under sea level. Uh, when you have a three to four degree warning, New York will be under sea level. And we're actually heading towards that reality. And if you have um, a five to six degrees, Bangkok will be under sea levels. So it's quite serious. I mean, we're talking about like this mega uh, big cities that are, it looks like they, if we don't take action when it comes to the carbon dioxide, or if we, find, if we don't find really, really good way to work against uh, oceans of the world, uh, these cities will definitely be under sea level. Um, they have also summarized a little bit of the heat. Uh, they have summarized some of the um, rainfalls. They have summarized, uh, for example, the, the corn and oat, which are some of the two of the most common crops in the world. Um, how much of that um, harvest will be lost due to global warming? Uh, so we're also facing a food shortage and a food crisis because it will be very, very difficult to farm in this kind of, uh, in this very, very warm, warm climate. Uh, we look at the um, increase, um, um, increase strength of um, different kinds of um, weather related disasters. So they will become more intense and they will become stronger which of course has a huge impact on humanity, on humans. And we also look in, they also, for example, said that number of species that will be extinct. Um, and we, I mean, when it comes to biodiversity loss, there's a lot of things that are, do, are contributing to that very, very uh, negative uh, trend of decreased um, biodiversity. But we can definitely say that when the temperature is increasing, it gets also, of course, more difficult for animals to find food, to find water, to find shelter. And it becomes too hot, basically, in some, some areas where, where they live. And, and this is very dangerous because some uh, climate deniers are also saying that the weather has changed before, temperatures has changed before. But normally, when they change quite quickly, there's been max, uh, mass extinctions. I mean, the animals, the species don't have the time to adopt. Uh, it has increased, this, I mean, it has changed before, but then we've been having, or, or the species that have been living on planet Earth at that time has had the ability to adopt. So a very, 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 very slow change could actually change genetics, or it could, I mean, it could change the development of, species and their behavior uh, or the, the evolution, but, um, but a very quick change like this just doesn't, gives no one a chance to adapt basically. There, there is no time to do that because the change is happening too quickly. And this is sea level rise. Um, what just has been summarized here is that um, sea level is increasing with three millimeters per year. And that will me mean um, that the sea level will increase with one meter. Um, yeah, to to twenty in eighty years compared to to now. Um, and of course, as I said, that it could be more, it could be less. Um, but looking at the signs that were available at this time. Um, and that's an average, of course, on the globe. So in some areas it will be more and in some areas it will, it will be less. Um, it has already increased with 25 centimeters um, since uh, 18, 1880. And this is a graph showing the sea levels increase as well uh, over time. So it's definitely related to a warmer planet results in a sea level rise. And these are again, the summary of the scenarios and related to the sea level rise, uh, that the less action we take, the higher sea levels. 
And Arctic, yeah, the ice, I think um, it might have been both fortunate and unfortunate that the um, polar bears and the situation uh, at Arctic has been the symbol for climate change. I mean, it's, it's true in the sense that climate change there is so evident and it's easily measurable. It's even visible for people who live there and people who visit. Uh, but it could also mean that some people have said that it could also mean that we, are, we can't really associate climate change to us. I guess Western people or people who are not living there. Um, because it feels like that's something that's ha happening far away. Uh, while climate change is actually something that happens here and now, if you look at your balcony or, or if you have a garden, um, you can see climate change based on the insects, how they're behaving, when they're coming, if there are more or less of them. Um, and the ice at the Arctic has decreased a lot. This is a measurement from the 1979, so a minus 44 percentage. And I would also say when they measure the ice in the Arctic, they normally do that in September. So they are, they are comparing the ice when it says is lowest point uh, throughout the years. And this is an image uh, showing the, the change, how big it is. And this is also very much related to geopolitical topics as well. Because suddenly, if the ice um, is, there's less ice, the, the whole ocean and travels on, around the Arctic becomes also more available, which means that with increased transport and increased presence, that, that is also threatening wildlife. And there could also be a higher risk of uh, pollution. Uh, for example, if an oil tank or oil transportation, um, yeah, there's a leakage or something like that. Uh, so there's also a very big political interest in the Arctic and it, it's actually also um, quite dangerous that suddenly this area has less ice and becomes more available. And here you can see how the ice is changing month by month. Um, throughout the year, it has its highest point in February, March, and has its lowest points in August and, and September. And you can, we can see that throughout time, it has, it's decreasing more and more and it's increasing more and more rapidly. And now we come into the energy. And I guess I would like to say also here about the ice is that um, I would highly recommend you to follow Fred and Melissa Sheffer, uh, that uh, Fred and Anant, there are two photographers and they, they do visit uh, Svalbard, for example, and they document the changes that's going on there. Um, they, this, is, this is highly dangerous for the polar bear. They might get extinct with what's going on. And I think that's truly, some people might not care about polar bears, but I think that's all, it says something awful about humans that we, uh, we're doing this to other species and they have no chance to adapt at all. Because with less eyes, the, the polar bear can't uh, use the normal behavior of uh, hunting uh, seals, for example, uh, but I'm not going to go too much into that now, but I would highly recommend you to read more about it. So energy, we're using more and more energy and we're living in a world of digitalization and electrification of everything we basically do. And I, th I think it's also interesting to see that even if we might get more energy efficient, we're still demanding more energy. And since the population of the planet is still growing, more and more people also want to access energy. Um, and here it says that we are using twice as much energy as we did 40 years ago. And the biggest source of energy is coal, uh, coal oil and gas, and which is, which is why we have this situation with the, the greenhouse. Uh, with, with the greenhouse gases or the climate change. 87 percentage uh, of the world uh, energy production comes from fossil fuels. And I have also added a graph here from WWF that shows uh, on a global level, on a global average. So this is not Sweden. Um, 
the um, which sectors are contributing to to the release of carbon emissions into the atmosphere and uh, it can it's it can be hard to know exactly what figures because there could be different methods for example there are scientists who says that um farm uh, agriculture should be way higher uh, if you look at the whole supply chain if you look at animal fodder and so on or like food systems and other says it should be way less it's like 14 percentage it's the same thing in fashion some people say it's like a few percentage others say it's seven percentage so there's it depends on the method on how you're measuring um but still and it looks quite different also uh, in Sweden, for example, we have a lot of our energy that are fossil free. Um, and but we do still have a lot of um, our transportation system is still very based on fossil fuels. Um, so in Sweden, for example, the transportation part is I think it's a third, but it's 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 way bigger. The usage of fossil fuels are still increasing um, we can sometimes read about and um, science or clean energy and and it's absolutely true that the usage of uh, renewable are increasing uh, but it's still too little compared to that we're still using more and more fossil fuels um, it's unfortunately we haven't stopped drilled for oil unfortunately we haven't stopped every coal plant and unfortunately there are parts in the world where they're planning to build, build, build new ones so when people wondering why all these climate activists are so angry and upset um, i mean it's I, I think one of the reasons is also that unfortunately we're seeing political decisions that are 100% against the Paris Agreement. Um, the, the only thing that would make sense now is to stop fossil fuels in the same way as we put the whole world in lockdown due to COVID. It's such a huge crisis we're currently going through that some things, it needs very strong political decisions to stop the usage of fossil fuels. And this is um, in Sweden, where we see the use of fossils, fossil fuels has decreased. I would, however, add that this is the use um, over time. But I would, however, add that in Sweden, we sometimes things were very good because the fossil fuels from transportation, industry, and so on are, are decreasing. And that has to do with new technology, but it also has to do with that a lot of the industries we used to have have moved abroad. They're simply not based in Sweden anymore. And if you look at the consumption based uh, footprint in Sweden, that hasn't changed since the 90s. We, we, we have a huge depth when it comes to our consumption behavior. So what we do in Sweden is of course very good when we are transforming our industries and our transportation systems and so on. But we need to do more when it comes to our consumption related. Uh, and also that has, this, uh, of course, that is not only up to the consumers. That's what I'm not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the footprint in Sweden is larger if you look, would look at the actions we're taking and the things we're actually doing. There, there's been some uh, calculations on that if we, this is how much carbon we have released so far. This is the current parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. How much do we have left? How much more can we emit before we hit the wall? And, and it's irreversible. Um, and that of course has to do with the, the Paris Agreement. So was just I've been summarizing here that to keep the global world under 1.5 degrees, it is still possible. I'm not sure, maybe the last few months some scientists would disagree. Um, I think it's still possible to keep it under two degrees. But that means the carbon budget is running out of time. Um, and if we keep this carbon budget, it's not like we have a hundred percentage of actually making it. We have a 67 percentage um, possibility to reach 1.5 degree target. So we're still gambling 
even if we're following this carbon budget. But this carbon budget is the, the best we have. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because I, I feel like it's so confusing for me now to have all this information in Swedish and trying to directly tra translate it. But, we, but we, there's a certain tons of carbon emissions we can emit. And there's a certain amount that we have already emit. Uh, so the clock is ticking. And this, I also think this illustration comes from Dagens, I would guess just has uh, taken this from Dagens Nyheter. Uh, so to give them credit because they're in, they're in, they're in, their name is not here. I might be wrong though, so please correct me. Um, so calculating how much we emit per year, uh, and we assume that we will keep on emitting as we're doing today, the next upcoming years. This is how quickly our budget runs out. So what I said in the beginning is that we are currently not seeing so much changes in the trends. Um, currently not, we, we, but, and if we're going to keep on doing, as it looks like we're doing the way, the way we're doing it, we only have seven years until this budget is finished, until the, the, yeah, the possibility to reach the Paris Agreement is completely gone. So we're running out of time. We only have a few years left to change the way we use and emit fossil fuels. We, we definitely need to stop emitting fossil fuels and we need stronger political actions to make this, to, to make sure this change is happening. Um, and uh, just is also referring to the IPCC special report, global warming of 1.5 degrees from 2018 in this work. Uh, so I would highly recommend you to check that out if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the science behind this calculations. Um, and he's been summarizing uh, a little bit um, what's uh, been written about this carbon budget and why we need to take such a strong action. And, and he's, for example, pointing out that this will have huge effects on humanity and the world economy. Um, we're talking about floods, we're talking about melting glaciers, we're talking about very severe drought, we're talking about increased conflicts. It, for example, people might not know, but um, in Syria, the, the war has been going on for 10 years. And there was a severe drought in Syria before the war, which was like resulting in millions of people having to, to um, uh, migrate and, and uh, move because they couldn't farm anymore. And I'm not saying that's the only cause of the war, not at all. Uh, I'm not an expert in that war. And uh, what I'm saying is I'm pointing out that when there's extreme weather change going on, especially in areas where the states are vulnerable, or, um, that that is a contributing factor to things are getting more tensed. Um, and another conflict is, of course, the access to fresh water. As the, flood, the glaciers are melting, the floods, the rivers, the access to water is decreasing. And there's many parts of the world where you have um, borders uh, where one country might actually, actually have a better access to a water resource than the other. And that might uh, create conflicts if they take all the water and the country next to them can't access. We, we are, I'm not going to point that example because I don't want to be political here, but that, that's a, a very evident and, and a big problem already today. Um, and of course the, the um, food production, we talked about that earlier. And this is this is threatening. This this is going to be going to be the increase of insurance systems for this. Uh, it's threatening insurance systems. It's threatening global trade. It's threatening political situations. It's threatening banks. This is a highly um, high risk scenario which the economy doesn't like uh, because the economy functioning the way that as, as long as we think the world is getting better, as long as you think that you will have interest rate on your current investments, we will keep on doing those investments. But if we think that things are getting too 
unpredictable, too hard, and there might be severe consequences we can't predict, we also start to lose faith about the future and we stop doing good investments, uh, which is not really good for, for human development. We're talking about health uh, with uh, more mild winters can, of course, in Sweden or Scandinavia countries, means that less people die, but it also means that we have this very, very strong, uh, very, very warm summers. And um, for example, it's also the change of the route of insects and birds, how they travel, and that has to do with the spread of diseases. Um, he's been he been writing here mentioning malaria that um, it could for example mean in some areas that the malaria mosquito has um, has higher chances to lay eggs or if it's more humid um, i'm not going to get into that um, and i think we're continuing from there um, and this is also from Dagens Nyheter, a short uh, movie that, changed, that explains a little bit the, the risks in Sweden and what, what are the scenarios and what we are seeing there. And this is also text about the carbon budget and the text about the water sea level, increase in sea level rise. Um, and also why it's so important to focus on the energy production because it has such a big part of the global emissions. We definitely need to transform the, the energy consumption, the energy systems and, the, and find better energy sources and focus on renewables. And the ocean are buffering from our climate. I, I talked about that. And yeah, so what I said a little bit earlier in this presentation is that are, there are some areas on the globe that this world is globally connected. Humans are globally connected, ecosystems are globally connected. And some of them have such an important role to play that their system is affecting the whole planet. And these are also big systems in the way that they're stabilize, stabilizing the current system we're in at the moment. And they have certain feedback mechanisms for how they operate. But if they are being pushed, if changes are happening, for example, in the Amazon, if there's a strong deforestation, um, that system might flip over to a new state. And that means from having this tropic humid climate, it suddenly switches over and become very, very dry. And the feedback mechanism is making it drier and drier and drier instead of more humid and warm. And these important, uh, he, these, these are tipping elements. And I think Johan Rockström, uh, uh, that the, the scientist and researcher Johan Rockström was also a part of this. I know he's been talking a lot about these tipping elements they, and they are called tipping points when an ecosystem is changing. And, and we have just recently started to understand these systems and how they are operating and if they are on the, the, the threshold to reach a tipping point. Just a few years ago, they said that they might reach a tipping point. Today, they're talking about some of them might have already uh, tipped over. Um, and this is highly dangerous because they will then help to make the climate warmer instead of cooler that their, their feedback mechanism is not good for for humanity or the world we want to live in i think some of you watched the news not long time ago speaking of the gulf um gulf uh, what do you call it now i forgot the word i'm so sorry but basically this is what makes it the climate livable up here in Scandinavia, that the currents are transform, transporting cold water from the Arctic down along the Atlantic um, to the south parts and up comes warm water. Uh, otherwise, Norway would be very, very cold if they didn't have that current of warm water. And there's been a lot of movies, no, not a lot of movies, I think maybe one, but there's been movies where they talked about that um, this, uh, this gold current might stop, which will make the climate very cold up in the north and hot and yeah, instabilize the whole world. And now they have actually, they do measure 
the strength of this current and it has shown i think it was a decrease of 20 percent which is scary um, of course and we don't know uh, how much it will change and of course this has to do with melting ice for example okay so i'm so sorry if uh, my presentation became a little bit um not this very smooth presentation because i had it in Swedish and I'm trying to directly translate it and of course I'm not not the person who's done this presentation either so this is these are the slides of Gösta Eriksson and um, but I still found it very important to share this message with you because he's absolutely right with everything he's pointing at, at in this presentation what is basically saying that we are in the middle of the climate crisis things are very serious and they will get worse and we need to take severe climate action to be able to meet the carbon budget and to be able to meet paris agreement and it is in the interest of all unfortunately not all humans um, not even in sweden when a lot of people are educated about this think that this has to do with them uh, there might be people today that maybe might get old without having too strong effects in their lives, but probably not, because what we see now with the COVID virus is that things like that, pandemics, economic instability, wars, um, refugees seeking new homes, um, those things will increase and get worse. And that means the whole world will be affected. Um, so even if you feel like you're living in a safe place, in a safe country, you're not. You're going to be affected as well. And for those of us who do care about each other and this planet, because we might find that these animals have, they have the right to live and we want to create the best possibilities for all humans in the world regardless of what, well, where they are born, to have the best possible lives. We all should take climate action. And I'm not going to tell you what you should do. And uh, there's a lot of focus on what we can do as individuals, which I found great. For example, is the meat consumption in Sweden decreasing every year? And that has to do with a lot of pe more people becoming flexitarians. They eat less and less meat. They're not becoming vegan, they just eat less. Um, we see now that during the pandemic, the, the emissions decrease with 7% in a year. And a lot of that has to do with transportation because we couldn't travel the way we used to do. Um, so of course you can take those actions if you find that meaningful and if you want to decrease your carbon footprint. And I would highly recommend everyone to measure the carbon footprint and take actions and of course do it the way you can and and i'm a huge advocate for mental well-being so i don't want to stress anyone and i don't want to call cause an anxiety but i also think we should definitely look beyond ourselves as individuals uh, because the, the the climate crisis is going to be solved by strong political actions that that's what the world needs at the moment and of course, in technology, innovation, all uh, consumer changes, all the things are, of course, very, very necessary. Um, but think about what you can do. And well, I said I would, shouldn't tell you what to do, and I almost started to write a list of things. But write down, I mean, read more, study more, learn more, uh, and write down what you can do. Is it changes in your private life? Is it changes in the way you do things? Can you vote from a different party? I mean, a lot of us live in still in democratic states. Can you write an article? Can you reach out to a politician? Can you ask a company how they're do, doing to reduce their uh, climate impact? Um, if all of us, if truly a lot of us would do something, we will have a huge shift. So this is not... Um, there's still hope out there and no one has to put this whole burden on the shoulder. We all can make minor changes and minor impact. And um, so, yeah, don't feel despair. I mean, we can, we can change things. We can change the course of the future. And if you find this presentation useful and meaningful, I would be super happy if you would share it 
I know Yosta would be so happy if he can see that his presentation and his words are being spread because that this meant a lot to him and he was such an amazing human being doing so much great work and he was truly a role model for me as well so it would also mean I think it would mean a lot to his family and everyone who knew him if he knew that um, we're, we're still taking action we're still spreading information we're still doing our best to to uh, make a difference so I would be very very happy if you could um, help him uh, to to um, help him to reach out with this with this message thank you so much for listening you're awesome if you've been listening to this whole presentation you are a change maker you are making this world a better place so thank you very much <laughs>